Mrs. Locke was a civilian during World War II. Mrs. Locke, where were you living when World War II broke out in Europe? I was living in a small town called Lipstadt, which is in Westphalia. It's um, part of the area that goes then to the Ruhrgebiet, which is quite an industrial area. However, where we lived, it was somewhat rural, with a larger airport, though, that was being constructed at the time when I lived there. And uh, um, my father worked for Mercedes-Benz, and they had constructed a secondary plant in that area so this is where my father was employed. That's one of the main reasons why my parents moved to this area, because of my father's job opportunities. And how old were you at the time? Um, during the, war, the beginning of the war, the outbreak of the war, I was 10 years old in 1939. Mm, that was and, what grade? Well, um, I guess it was different. In your Let's see, I started school at six, so I would be, I think I had just started leaving the what we call Volksschule, which would be like a public school, and I went to a private school, and I was in the first grade of a private all-girls school at that time. Was it in the same area? As yes, it was a boarding school, and we had many out-of-town students, however, I was a day student, and uh, it was a Catholic school, uh, mostly staffed by nuns at the time, with the Mother Superior, of course, also being a nun, and um, that later on during the war years greatly changed, however. Um, when the war, leading up to the war, what was going on um, in the months leading up to the actual breakout of war? Um, at uh, that time, personally, I was not that interested in politics. Being young and so forth, it's not something that you pay particular attention to. There were quite a few changes. Um, my parents, neither one of them ever joined the NSDAP, which would be their national party. My father, as a result of this, did not receive any promotions during the war years. However, his employment continued, and uh, he had a good position. He was an engineer, and um, he um, absolutely did not believe in Hitler's ideas, nor did my mother. And my grandparents, on my, my maternal grandparents, were of similar persuasions. I was not too certain about my father's parents, although I do know for a fact that they did not become party members. At that time, my um, grandparents, paternal grandparents, were getting elderly, and I think their interests were more in terms of retirement and leading a comfortable life, if possible. Uh, when the war actually broke out and was declared, what were your feelings at that time? Well, immediately you uh, know that your life will change. As a young person, you're kind of excited. You wonder what is going to happen. And there was quite a bit of propaganda, of course, and we had changes within our school system. The public schools, of course, were changed immediately, and it was approximately a year and a half before we saw changes in the school that I attended. And at that time, my brother already had been recruited and he was actually forced into the service so I was the only one at home and my father would have still been eligible for war service however because of his position and they had converted the factory 
to military use in the meantime was kept at home and he had served my father had served during World War One and he and his father both were in World War One my father being the oldest of seven sons and um, um, so I heard a lot of talk at home and um, well, when Hitler went into Poland of course there was discussion in school in regard to this and once our administration changed there was a vast change in the teaching first of all we had a crucifix in each classroom prior to the administrative change that was replaced with a photograph of Adolf Hitler in each classroom and our most of the nuns with the exception of two nuns that were kept on for another two years we then had a whole new group of teachers they were all lay teachers and um, our teaching changed in regard especially to his to history and uh, there was more of an emphasis on nationalism at that time which started almost immediately with the changes and um, my classmates and I frankly did not discuss this too greatly then we uh, sort of lived still in a world I thought that was you know nothing is going to happen to us and it was the beginning of the war prior to the bombing and you still think that well you know your life is going to be secure and well that of course changed drastically and um, should I continue or would you want to ask me a question I would like to ask you when the administration and, uh, and your teaching staff changed, yes. I'm assuming that uh, maybe new subjects were introduced and there was a lot of propaganda being taught at that time? Um, not to the extent that it is believed in the United States. I, um, in regard to history, there were changes. I will have to say that. But I mean, they, they cannot change the facts prior to their regime. That would have been impossible. Um, one of the things that changed, of course, was um, we used to start our mornings with a prayer of thanksgiving. That, of course, was totally eliminated and no more teaching of religion. Although I will have to say during the entire war years, none of the, of the nuns were removed from the premises they had their separate quarters we still use the same school physically speaking outside of maybe that you saw the photographs of Hitler and so forth there were no drastic changes you did still see the nuns occasionally and uh, one of the great changes I will have to say was a terrific emphasis on physical education gymnastics on a daily basis a great deal of swimming and you know it was mind and body which was being trained as far as the I guess Aryan idea was concerned that was never mentioned per se um, we had of course two students that actually disappeared uh, one of the families were friends of my parents and they owned a um, we call it fish holler which means all you sell is fish and it was a very elaborate beautiful establishment because we were not that far from the North Sea so we had a lot of meals where fish was our mainstay and um, my friend one morning did not come to school and there was not much explanation a few students asked and it was said the family Jung was their name 
had decided to leave and this was prior to the time where actually the stores were being demolished and so forth. I never found out what happened so both my parents and I were hoping that they were able to leave and get out of the country and that would have been the beginning of 40 and yeah 1940 yeah, in the middle of four, nine, 1940, yes. Was this a Jewish family? Yes, it was a Jewish family. And uh, my mother um, had also befriended a Jewish family. My mother came from a different area. And my father was born close to the town that we lived in. But my mother came from a total different, totally different area. Her parents were both born in Austria and then later emigrated to Germany because of job opportunities and uh, um, my mother had very good friends actually lived very close to the synagogue we did have a synagogue and we had a great many Jewish merchants that had beautiful establishments well-run stores and so forth and I do vividly recall their the um, um, Hitler regime came in, it was the NSDAP, a group of brown shirts at that particular time yet. Um, and they actually destroyed merchandise, they went into the homes. Many of the merchants lived above their stores. This was common practice in Germany at that time, as in many European countries for sake of convenience and um, they were beautiful old large homes and actually some of their belongings that were small enough were thrown out of the windows into the streets uh, pianos were shoved onto the sidewalks and well most of the things were actually destroyed I don't think there was much looting going on you know I did not particularly see anything my mother and I quickly left and went home and there was some force being exerted at that time with clubs and so forth and uh, then I do remember not personally but of course very aware of Kristallnacht you know the which was another frightening thing and then my mother's friends also disappeared and uh, we never did find out but my mother did go to what would be the administration of the city which we call the Bürgermeister which would be like a mayor of a town and um, that position was held in high esteem prior to the war years more so than during the war years because a lot of the original administration also was replaced and people that had a background with the National Party took positions of former employees and she never did get any answer and they said there was no word of knowing where they had gone and so forth so unfortunately we did think I we did not know about concentration camps at the time and then a third thing occurred which was rather frightening a family not in our immediate neighborhood not on the same street where we lived but the street over and we only knew them by name but we also knew that the gentleman the father of three children was connected with the Communist Party while well, he disappeared and then his wife was taken prisoner the grandmother took care of the children both mother and father were never heard of again so you know as political prisoners we surmise that eventually you know, when we found out about concentration camps that they were killed in concentration camps um. You were so young, and I know how important peer pressure is 
to the students here. Were you torn at any time between perhaps what some of your fellow students were thinking and what your parents thought, their beliefs? Were you kind of torn thinking maybe this is true? Yes, in a way I was torn. I had friends whose parents were definitely Nazis because they had very strong feelings. For one thing, the economy was booming because of the war effort and this influenced the thinking of many people because their lifestyle was improved. But prior, of course, to this, my parents had experienced great difficulties. What was considered a depression in this country was much worse in Germany because because of the Versailles Treaty, the uh, war reparations were such that it was almost impossible to follow any of this. And then on top of it, we had tremendous, it wasn't just inflation. The, um, my mother remembers where it took a basket of money, a large basket of money to purchase one loaf of bread. Often when my father was paid on a Friday, he was not salaried at that time, he was not in management, um, she would go and pick up his paycheck and by the time she would reach any of the stores the money was already devalued. So living was very, very difficult and as I said before, when lifestyles change, well many people thought well, here is Hitler and he's improving things for the country and they went along with some of the uh, uh, his thinking and so forth, his ideologies and um, I, I really was never that politically inclined and my brother was already gone and that caused my mother great, great problems because he was so young. He's only 15 years old and uh, we did not hear from him for about six weeks and then we had a letter and he was taken out of, he was, he's, my brother is four years older than I am and, uh, or three years older, yeah, three years older and he, um, three and a half, he was born, yeah, three and a half actually. Um, he was taken from Germany, this was after they went into France, to Brest, which is in the British Channel, and the Germans had their submarine pens there. And he was trained there, and after six weeks' time, he was sent to one of our large harbors, it's called Kiel, K-I-E-L, and that's in Schleswig-Holstein, which is Schleswig-Holstein and Denmark are joined by a 30-mile border because you go from there into Denmark and uh, this is where the Germans had a fabulous large harbor and he stayed there for another six months or so and my mother and I were able to visit with him because my mother had a sister-in-law that lived in this area and my brother was assigned to a submarine and from there he went into the areas of Narvik, well, uh, Norway all the way up to Narvik and the submarines were the ships and that controlled the waters and they bombed a lot of the supply ships that went all the way to Murmansk, you know, but this was when the Russians became allies and so forth and um, so prior to that, my brother and I had a couple of experiences so where my brother, upon entering a store, this was before he was taken away and he really was literally taken away because he, you could not object. Um, he had entered a store as a grocery store my mother had sent him to where we had been good customers and had a had an account where you paid on a monthly basis and the owner changed his way of thought drastically 
as my brother entered the store, and you know he's well known because the son was a friend of my brother's, my brother used a greeting of Grüß Gott, which means God's greetings, which we used to go to Austria quite a bit with still having cousins there and so forth, and that is their way of greeting. Or he would say, Guten Morgen, if it was a morning, good morning. Well, he really was called down by the parents of his good friend as well as his friend because you were supposed to enter a store and say Heil Hitler. And those were some of the changes that I would say on a daily basis that we noticed. Were there, as the war progressed, were there shortages in oh. food? Shortages, I mean, there was really nothing anymore. My mother ended up with just about uh, taking everything in a bartering type of system. She went to farmers, first linens, some silver. Eventually our piano went and my toys, and I had some very nice toys, were used. The farmers evidently had some idea of the outcome of the war because they did not accept money anymore. And uh, uh, without that, we could not have survived because, well, we had the rationing cards, but especially as 1944 started, it, it, it was just unbelievable what you had to live on. We were very fortunate we had a good sized garden behind our house. It's a good good sized piece of property by German standards. And then um, also my parents had rented a plot of land that we had cultivated. It was what generally was done in Germany to begin with, that you had an additional piece of land where you would grow vegetables. You would rent this piece of land. It did not belong to you. And uh, as a result of that, we had a great many vegetables and also there were fruit trees, bearing fruit trees in our backyard. And this helped. Did anybody try to take your food? Though? No, no, not that. But um, for instance, if you had any kind of, and this happened to people that we knew, if you would get permission to buy a pig and so forth, and you had the facilities to raise a pig, but may, may it be in your backyard, or you had a stable behind your house, which a lot of people did then, you had to register this, and then you had to have permission, and prior to killing, this had to be also registered, had to be recorded. If you did this illegally, they called it a, like a black market type of thing. There was a severe punishment, often actually you were taken away and there was a prison sentence. And if you did this on several occasions, it actually could end up in your death. So these things were greatly watched and uh, also naturally about black marketing which went on. If you were caught, there were a great many punishments for it. Was there bombing? Yes, um, not until about 19, well with the factories for instance, for, it started around 1943 and we went to the, there were shelters that were being built and in the end we went to the shelters practically all the time because nighttime bombing and daytime bombing towards the end of the war was so severe and they had a large airport outside of our town which was used for military purposes and that was bombed heavily and then we were uh, one of the major railroad crossings for the Ruhrgebiet which was not that far away that is of course where the main ma manufacturing took place and uh, they had coal mines in that area and so forth and they were bombing the railroad stations and all their lines and so forth. And also they were passing through, you know, on their way to other major cities.
So, you know, you had your um, uh, air raid sirens going, and school was difficult at that time. The schooling was difficult because so often we had to leave the classrooms to go to the shelters. And um, um, my one thing I would like to mention is that my mother had several sisters and one of her sisters, an older sister, was married and she lived, um, my aunt lived in a town called Bielefeld, quite a manufacturing town. And my uncle, who had been born in Alsace Lorraine, spoke both French and German fluently. and. Uh, he worked for a well-known company at that time, and which was Bayer Leverkusen, you know, it's Bayer, you call it here, and um, had a good position with that company. And his one son was in the army, and he had been sent to Russia. This was during the winter where they were actually attacking Stalingrad, and my uncle was very concerned about his son. And he listened to a broadcast that was a black broadcast. It happened to be a Russian broadcast. And the Germans were still saying that we were victorious and so forth, which of course was a lie. And the next morning my uncle relayed the information he had heard to a trusted friend at work. And within a half an hour my uncle was taken out of his office and he was then transported to a small concentration camp which is outside of Potsdam that's outside of Berlin and he was killed how he was killed we never found out but he was considered a political prisoner and then his son was killed in Stalingrad and my aunt also lost one of her granddaughters as her daughter was trying to flee from Berlin, there was um, bombing on the roads. There were so many refugees, you know, that were from Eastern Germany trying to get into the Western part. So um, it was very difficult for my aunt, you know, as my brother lost two of his brothers in World War II, both in France, and then his youngest brother. He was severely injured in Aachen. They had tremendous, tremendous street fights there. It was very difficult for the Allies getting into Aachen. And he had his arm was, well, the whole shoulder, the left shoulder and arm were gone and part of, well, all this area. And he actually survived by lying in a I think it was in a corner of a building and then it was the Americans who took him to a hospital. But he had so many difficulties after the war and his wife had been killed during the war. So my uncle eventually committed suicide, which was very sad for my father, you know. And we firmly believe it was a result of some of the war experiences. Time were you forced to join the Hitler Youth? Yes, you are. You are forced. I was. Um, I had to belong to the BD, but it was BDM, the Bund Deutscher Mädel. We say BDM, and you had to wear a uniform. And uh, there were weekly meetings, and everybody had to play some type of musical instrument. There's nothing difficult. Um, we call it a block photo, which would be a recorder. And then you had to go away to camp where you were taught to defend yourself in a way, not physically as much as looking out for your personal uh, well-being by being maybe in the elements. If you were in the woods, for instance, and you were abandoned, something during the war that could have happened where you would would have been separated from your parents and you had to find food and so forth we had to do all our own cooking and everything and it was very austere this camp 
cold water, cold running water only for showers and so forth. So uh, there was no pampering of any kind. That was part of what they called you toughen the body, you know, in order to withstand rigors. Was it fun now for a young Yes, child? in a way, you know, well, one of the things, well, the marching I'm sure you're aware of, you know, the, the Germans are great for what we call wandern, which means you hike. My parents, they did that into their eight, well, my dad died when he was 70, but my mother and her two sisters and friends, they would hike on a daily basis. And when they were hiking, and I mean, this was really strenuous, in mountains where my mother's parents lived, they would sing, and they were beautiful old songs, not national, nationalistic type of songs. They were what we call folk tunes, you know, folk song. And uh, um, a lot of them were actually written by some of our great poets. Well, one of them being Lessing, and he happened to be Jewish, and he was written Heine, was one of our, Heinrich Heine was one of our greatest poets. And you, we were not allowed to read his poetry anymore. That was forbidden because many of the great books, of course, nationally had been burned. And uh, so these were some of the songs that we would still sing because we would sit in our backyard and neighbors would come and we'd harmonize at night. It was a wonderful feeling of friendship and so forth. So. We did sing many of the songs. They weren't necessarily to do with Hitler and so forth. So that was fun. And out in the countryside and, uh, you know, during the summer months. And then during the last year, 1944, we all had to help with the harvest because it was very difficult because of bombing and so forth. And most of the men were gone, including the young boys. So every able-bodied person, including my mother, we all had to, we were picked up in the morning in the town square and then taken to the fields, you know, to help with the harvest, whatever was still there. When the Jews were taken away, were you and your neighbors aware of what was going on in the concentration camps? Were there I, rumors? I didn't even know there were concentration camps. I truly did not. And my parents, I have no idea if they did. They never discussed it. Um, my father, for instance, had a number of Frenchmen working for him. Now they were, that was forced labor. They were intelligent men that had been uh, trained, they were tool and die makers and so forth, and uh, they uh, lived in barracks outside of the factory, which was controlled. There was a gate where you entered and so forth. My father treated these men very well because after the war, several of the people that were uh, German people I'm speaking of, actually were killed by some of these workers. And we had one of the men, Francois, who would come to our house. And I was taken French then. I started with Latin and English and then French. And he often helped me with my French studies and so forth. And he would come to our house. He was allowed to. My father would sign him out. And he helped with our yard work and so forth in the garden. and. Uh, He's a jolly person, and my mother would try to fix him a decent, halfway decent meal and so forth because their living conditions were worse than ours were. And uh, um, I never heard my parents speak of concentration camps. First of all, in the area where I lived, there really was not a concentration camp close by. Later on, of course, we knew about it naturally. And then, I don't know if my husband during his interview mentioned this, but both he and I visited during our visits to Germany and to Poland. We went to Buchenwald, and when we were in Poland, we visited 
uh, Dachau and Birkenau and uh, no Dachau um, I'm not Auschwitz and Birkenau Dachau is outside of Munich and uh, um, well the horrors are still present so physically and emotionally you're devastated for days afterwards the Poland trip we did with a group of people in fact there were a number of Jewish travelers in our group and after spending several days in Warsaw then we, had, we went to Krakow and we went to Auschwitz and Birkenau and we spent a whole day in Auschwitz and Birkenau and uh, you never know what it was like until you personally visit and uh, but during the war I never knew about this how often did you hear from your brother you well um, we heard very little um, in the beginning he would write on a regular basis and my brother actually was torpedoed and managed to he lived he was he um, picked up by Norwegians and um, he survived the war he was a prisoner of war of the Americans British and Americans came in and he was treated very well he was taken to southern Germany from Norway and um, um, he it was a very difficult life being a submariner because their death rate was extremely high I believe only about I think close to 90 percent were killed and um, he uh, he's not the type of person to elaborate on his war experiences so we were really not a, a, a political type of, of uh, family and I discussed with my parents after the war some of these things that happened and I have to in all honesty I have to admit that they did not care too much to talk about this it's, it's generally known there is a great deal of guilt connected with this and I have read a number of books and one of them is particularly good it's by Ursula Hage and she wrote Stones from the River which is a great book and lived in Germany but she has in this country since she teaches here uh, somewhere in the uh, Northwest at a university she has actually interviewed children that were born during the war and has had similar experiences that the parents do not like to discuss what happened to the war and I believe it's guilt that causes this um, since you were so very young and things were I would imagine very fearful um, how, how did you cope with the stress that, that must have put on you as a child uh, well in the beginning especially in regard to bombing when you first it there is I don't know it's almost I saw a film once it was a British film it was great I can't recall the title but you know the children are somewhat excited all these big planes are flying over and all of course then reality comes home and yes there is a certain amount of fear but youth is resilient and I think you just you, you sort of accept what is happening but what else can you really do you you live with it um, I do remember distinctly when the Americans came into our town they had tried to defend the city for about four days and we are surrounded by rivers where I live and all the bridges had been blown up and we had several hospitals where we had a lot of people that had been injured during the war and so forth and finally the mayor of the town decided to capitulate and I think it was a humanitarian type of effort on his part because he realized how many more people would die if he would not do so and um, so when the Americans came in 
we were all in a shelter and there were about three or four soldiers that entered the shelter and one of them said are there any in English are there any German soldiers being hidden here because a lot of German soldiers were trying to change into civilian clothes and they were coming into homes especially the SS and and they said does anyone speak English and I did speak English so I said I do <laughs> and they asked me and I said no and they really were not and then life was tremendously chaotic this was about the worst time that I can recall since the war was not over you know the fighting was still going on and every displaced person including the prisoner of wars from Russian and Polish prisoners and the Italians who had been our allies but then changed everybody was free and they were wandering the streets and my dad had been taken off his job and he'd been put into what they call a Heimwehr this was the last resort of the Germans they took every able-bodied person including 12 year olds and 13 year olds and put him into the Heimwehr which was training for the shortest period of time and they used bazookas uh, to stop tanks and so forth and my dad was gone and and he was in had been forced to go into the Heimwehr so there was nobody there that could defend mothers and children and then the looting started and they came into homes and a group of Russians came into our backyard and my mother and I they, they knocked on the door on our back door and my mother came out and they saw me and they asked my mother for schnapps which is like a, a whiskey and we really didn't have any my mother said no and they said do you have food we said no and we actually did not and one of them kind of started to take my hand and my mother said no and they said we'll be back and my mother was scared to death but they returned in a half an hour or so and they brought us rations from the Americans food to eat and they said you eat it. they spoke German they said Essen which means eat and they never harmed us so um, and then no stores were open or anything and my mother actually did leave and she tried to get to a farmer that she knew and she walked through a river she had a bicycle she was able to get to the river left her bicycle on the one side because she could not get there were some bridges on smaller rivers left but at each bridge they had Americans posted because you were not allowed to leave so it was like um, there was a curfew and you could could not even go out at certain times of the day I think an hour or two only so she was able to get a few things but when she returned somebody had taken her bicycle so uh, well at least she was not harmed so there, there were a lot of bad things that were happening can you relate one or two of your most memorable experiences during this time my the return of my father and my brother I would say and also when the Americans liberated our town because the war was over and the Americans were kind we were never harmed in any way um, when my father came back my mother it was fabulous and my brother came back about seven months after the war ended and he was well and alive and so those I would say are the best best of my memories and uh, uh, the worst would be losing relatives and um, um, also the um, after result of the war it was very very difficult living in Germany 
in fact I decided with a group of classmates there were three well not a group but three of us to perfect my English I went to English I had already studied pharmacy but things things were so difficult in Germany and I, I had worked for three years and tried to get my degree but then things became so difficult in Germany that I decided to go to England to perfect my English and perfect perhaps as a result of that have the opportunity to work for the Americans and when did you finally come to America? I came to the United States in 1953 and um, um, I felt very welcome in this country. Is there any one lesson you feel you might have learned from the war and its aftermath? Um, I will say this. If at all you have the courage to speak up, do so. A lone person, it's very difficult. I realized during the war there, there were many efforts made um, in regard to trying to change the regime. There were attempts. It seems that unfortunately there were too many people that really wanted Hitler as their leader. And then when things were realized that actually it was for the worst of the country, he had gained such a stronghold that he used the methods of killing in order to persuade people not to speak up. And I think it's very difficult to make that ultimate choice between life and death. But if you don't believe in something, do speak up. And um, I think particularly in this country, you do have the freedom of speech. You may not be as popular as some people and if you go against the crowd and you feel about war the way I do, um, you hopefully you don't lose friends, at least not true friends, because I do think you know, this is one of the great things your opinion does count and speak up and speak up when you know something is wrong. Is there any 